All right, so let's give Dale Hardy a warm welcome. Well, thank you. Um, thank you for everyone coming out today. Um, I'm sure we'll have some others coming in here in a few minutes and making their way over here. But um, today we, I will talk about the domes primarily, but uh, to start out with, I'm going to give a little information on R.G. himself uh, and um, his life. Uh, one of the things that I, in giving other presentations and getting questions and, and being, dealing with the history of the company, the school, uh, a lot of times it comes back to the family. And um, today we see, we hear about R.G. and, you know, his, all of his inventions and he had this factory, he started the school, and we, you know, we tend to, to see someone like that and not knowing anything about their personal life, we could assume, well, you know, he just had it made, you know, uh, his whole life, and uh, decided, come on in, come on in. And um, then uh, his inventions... He, you know, you might think, well, he just decided what, what today's thinking. People might think, well, I need to make some money, so I'm going to invent something, then I'm going to sell it, and I'll make a lot of money. Well, I can tell you that never entered R.J.'s mind. Money was never even considered. In fact, he spent too much, and the, the, the uh, managers and the directors of the uh, factories that he had was often telling him that. <laughs> And his sons, that once they got into management. But um, RG, his, his life as he started out, in, uh, it wasn't all that wonderful as we might uh, look back and think of someone that ended up in his position. <coughs> when RG, and when RG uh, after, in the mid 30s, he not only had several factories that he would travel to, that was when he started traveling extensively to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he would always start out his speeches by, uh, I'm just a mechanic that the Lord has saved. And that was a very true perspective of how he saw himself. He never saw himself as a big inventor or, you know, someone with a lot of money. They lived a very simple life. <coughs> Um, in fact, um, in their entire life, Mr. and Mrs. Letourneau, in their entire life, they only built, had two houses of their own. One is still standing over on the factory property over there as well. So we don't own it now. Another, a family owns it. That was his last house. <clears throat> the other one was built in Tacoa, Georgia. But that one was made with uh, <coughs> steel panels. It was experimental type home. But everywhere else he lived, <coughs> uh, they rented houses, and they didn't have these big fancy houses. When they moved to Longview, they lived in what was the officer's quarters here from the school, from, um, from Harmon General Hospital, which is what this property was. They um, did some remodeling because they still had five or six kids at home. And they just lived in the old officers' quarters, one of the old buildings, original buildings of the campus. So they were never tried to flaunt who they were or what they had or anything like that. Um, but R.G., this, uh, I'm going the right way here, there. <clears throat> this is Mr. R.G. when he was about 13 years old. Um, he, um, he, R.G. was, um, he was the middle child, uh, let's see, of um, seven kids. No, that, those were his, uh, of, of five. <coughs> he was born in uh, Rockford, Vermont. When he was very little, they moved to Duluth, Minnesota. And they lived there for quite a while, really through his, till he was in the seventh grade. Uh, you hear people, when they're talking about R.G., well, he dropped out of the, he had an eighth grade education, generally is what it said. Well, technically he had a seventh grade education, because 
he was still in seventh grade to Duluth, Minnesota, when the whole family moved to Portland, Oregon. And that is where he started the eighth grade. Um, now, from his book, Moved Many Mountains, he tells in here, in the eighth grade, he was about my size, six foot tall at 160 pounds. In the eighth grade. <laughs> so, he moved to a new school, didn't know anybody, probably the biggest kid in the eighth grade. He went to school, tried to get into the little eighth grade desk, and after the first day or so, he went home and said, told his dad, he actually said, I'm a man grown. That's what he said, and that was it. That was the last day of his formal education. Um, you see all this around us, and it came from a man and his ideals and principles that had a seventh grade education. <clears throat> so, um, RG stands for Robert Gilmore. Uh, and he was born in, in, in Richburg, Vermont, in 1888. But um, he moved to Portland, and after the eighth grade experience, he told his dad, you know, I'm done. Well, he was physically large enough to go to work, so his dad said, okay, you're going to work. So um, his dad had some friends that worked in, or some may have owned, uh, a foundry, an iron foundry there in the area. <clears throat> so they put R.G. to work. In those days, the casting of iron in molds, they used sand molds. You formed in sand the objects that you want to cast, put them together, and you poured it in there. So, therefore, a lot of sand had to be moved back into certain ways. R.G. was coming in. His job was the wheelbarrow, wheelbarrows full of sand from one location to the other. And again in his book, he says, <clears throat> I moved about 10 wheelbarrows of that stuff before I figured out there has got to be a better way to move. <laughs> so, you know, just saying. <clears throat> so he worked in the iron foundry there in the Portland area, and then later on he went to San Francisco. <clears throat> Um, where in San Francisco, in 1906, where is it? 1906, I believe it was. He was working in an iron, iron foundry, had him a rented a room, a typical apartment house. The ground floor was the uh, living air, uh, was like living room, kitchen, dining room, bedrooms were the second, third. 1906, and you may know, in San Francisco was the earthquake and resulting fire that burned half the town down. That night, R.G. was asleep in his room on the second floor. The earthquake hit, and he said he woke him up during the night and his chest of drawers was shifting the sides of the room, and that's what woke him up. And during that time, the whole building collapsed. The first story collapsed into the basement. There was no one down there no one was hurt in his building. But he woke up, all of that's going on, the building collapsed down, <clears throat> and he said, again, he says, I realize I probably wasn't going to be able to stay there that night. <laughs> so he gathered his clothes, put in a suitcase, stepped out of his second story window onto the ground, and walked away. Now, amazingly, in the archives here in the library, we have a letter, handwritten letter, that he wrote to his mother. Of course, all communication was down. His parents were still in Portland. Um, everybody was trying to find out if people were okay, get you know, communication. He wrote a letter to his mother that said, I'm okay. You know, this has all happened, but I'm fine. And they actually have that handwritten letter in the archives in, at the school. <coughs> but... Uh, so, you know, this is just one experience of many that R.G. had in his life. When we think about somebody like that and we think about, you know, they had a privileged life, you know, and they just, they, they probably didn't go through hard times. <laughs> but he did. Um, a little while later, <clears throat> he, uh, he had uh, 
become a mechanic working on motorcycles and cars. Um, the, the stories they tell us that he would, he could just, if something happened to a vehicle, he would just dismantle it right there, take it all apart, fix the problem, and put it back together. He was that mechanically inclined. <clears throat> and um, he um, started uh, a business with a man, that, a car business, and they would work on any kind of vehicle. But um, he was the mechanic. He would take care of all the repairs. The other men would sell cars. So had a dealership going. And it was combining several things here in that time frame. It was about this time that uh, he had him a car that he souped up, you know. And they, in the town, in Stockton, California, that's where he had gotten up to Stockton by this time, he uh, would take his car to the local horse racing track. Now, they didn't have car racing tracks at the time because that no one was actually doing that other than illegally out on the dirt road somewhere. But uh, they would allow cars on the horse racing track. He took his car out there one day with some other guys and they were racing. Of course, this is a big oval. And racing a car of that in 1914 or so around in there, it wasn't just one person. You actually had to have a mechanic on board. So there were two people in every car. You had the driver. He was concentrating on driving. The mechanic was doing everything else that needed to be done. RG was the mechanic. They rounded the curve. <coughs> One of the wheels, the tire, came off the car. And it, they were in a curve, but it sent them straight into a fence. Now, this fence was very stout and very strong to protect the, the people behind it. When it hit the, the fence, it, the story tells it just ripped out a whole section of the fence. Both of them were injured. RG was laying off to the side, and the people that ran out to help them looked over, and they saw him, and they assumed that he was dead. So they went to help the other guy. And he's laying there the whole time like, come on, you know, help me over here. Well, when, in the end result, <coughs> he had broken his neck. He didn't sever his spinal cord, but he broke his neck. Um, so, of course, in 1914, there really wasn't much they could do about that. They took him to the hospital and straightened it up and kind of tied it there and sent him home. And so a family took him in. He, was, he just had an apartment. All of his family were still in Oregon. A family took him in uh, from their church, and um, so he rested and was recuperating there. <coughs> and... Um, that's where, in that home, he met Miss Evelyn, later to be his wife. And uh, during that time, they fell in love, and later on, uh, they married. Uh, when they married, he was 29, and she was 17. And at that time, there was some gasp, okay? Well, during that time, that was like, no, that was unheard of. Well, her dad <coughs> really thought bad of that. <clears throat> Not only that, they eloped. They snuck out of the house, they eloped and were going to Mexico to get married in Mexico. Well, that, her dad found out about it <clears throat> from Stockton, California all the way to Mexico. He called all of the sheriff's departments <laughs> all the way and they were waiting on them as they got there and they slipped past quite a few of them, but they were finally caught before they got to Mexico and sent back home. Well, I don't know, a few months later, um, they tried it again. <coughs> Dad gets on the phone, starts calling everybody. This time they made it to Mexico, and they got married. Her dad was so mad at him that literally her dad did not speak to R.G. for seven years. I mean, that he was serious. <laughs> did not speak to him for seven years. Um, <clears throat> but during this time, uh, his neck eventually healed enough to where he could kind of sort of hold it up straight. He tells a story that he'd gotten his strength back. <clears throat> he had a bunch of motor working on motorcycles. He was test driving a motorcycle that he had worked on, driving down the road probably too fast, knowing him. A dog ran out in front of him. He swerved to miss the dog and ran, crashed into the ditch. And he said the first thing he came to his mind was, here we go again, because he knew he had hit his head and he felt that he had injured it, 
But in fact, it popped his neck the other direction, and he could hold it up straight after that. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, that's what happened. <clears throat> so, um, uh, uh, Mom and Pop had seven children. Two are still living today, and they both live here in Longview. Their only daughter, uh, Miss Louise, uh, Miss Louise Dick, her husband was Gus Dick, and uh, he has passed away, but Miss Louise is still here. She's 96, uh, and she is in assisted living here in town, and their youngest son, Ben, lives here, and uh, Ben is, uh, he's 79 now, and, uh, and uh, he's, I visit with him occasionally, and, uh, but uh, the other, other of their seven children have passed away. <coughs> <clears throat> so, uh, another tragedy that was in his life, 1937, he'd already built his factory in Stockton, California. He'd actually moved to Peoria, Illinois, secretary, second factory in 35, but this was, uh, and then he had already started traveling to speaking engagements, telling people about Christ. This was 1937 that he and Miss Evelyn and four guys from the factory were a quartet that he would carry with him to sing at these uh, engagements that he had. They were traveling in uh, Tennessee, <coughs> and uh, they were, I think they had finished, they were headed back home. Rural road, were in a curve, and a car was coming towards them. Now, the Mr. Turno and the three other guys were asleep. The driver was awake, of course, and Mr. R.G. was sitting in the back seat. He was awake. The others were all asleep. They were in this curve, this oncoming car. The driver could see that he was talking. The driver was leaning to the back, turning around, talking to people in the back seat. So he was crossing the line into their path. The road was built up a little bit there, so he couldn't just get off into a pasture. He got off as far as he could, but they hit almost a head-on collision. And it killed all three occupants of the oncoming car. It killed the two people on the driver's side, front and back, <coughs> in R.G.'s car. And those two guys were brothers. Um, Mr. Turno in the middle and the front, the other two guys, and R.G. in the middle and the back. <coughs> Them being asleep, uh, they, they didn't brace themselves, so they were just kind of running around. They got injured. They got glass and cuts and braces and that sort of thing. But none of their injuries were serious. But R.G., he was awake and he saw it coming and knew they, was, they just couldn't avoid it. He braced himself and in doing that, when the collision hit, it drove both of his leg, his thigh bones through this hip socket into his chest cavity. Broke almost I don't know how many bones in his entire body. <coughs> so again, emergency crews get there. Uh, they thought he was deceased. And they're checking everybody else to get him to the hospital. So they roll him into the hospital. And they have him all in the, the uh, in beds there in the emergency room. The doctors gather around and they're starting to prioritize who we're going to work on first. Well, they kind of motion over to RG and said, well, you know, Let's take these other guys. They, we can help them. We can't help him. If we try to do anything to pain, it, it's going to take him out. They thought he was asleep. He was awake. And he was listening to all this. <laughs> okay, they're thinking he's either dead or asleep. And he chimed in and said, y'all get busy on me. He said, you let me worry about the pain. <laughs> Just fix me up. And they go, oh, you know, so they take him in. Anyway, they... Straighten him out and put him in a full body cast except for one arm. <coughs> and um, so, and then he goes home later recovering from that. And I should have included that we have a picture of him. While he was laying there, he designed a little cart with big pneumatic tires that they would put him on this cart and the guard would push him through the factory. Because he was one, he was in the factory every day. If he wasn't out speaking somewhere, he was in the factory going like, "Oh, let's work on this problem." Well, we have a picture of him in the factory 
telling somebody, you know, we need to do this or that, and laying down in a full body cast except for this one arm, and he's going, okay, do this, or that. the guards are pushing him. And that's just the drive that he had, you know. Um, but again, you know, when you think of RG, you know, don't think him of someone that just had a cushy life that could uh, just invent something, you know, and you thought about it. Um, he does have, a, he did have a lot of inventions. He's got uh, right around 300 patents in his name. But everything he invented, the patents and all of that that went along with it, all of that came from filling a need. He never sat around and said, I'm going to invent something today. You know, what do you want me to invent today? That, you know, that was not part of his thinking. All of these things came from filling a need in his factory or, you know, just a need that he had encountered because he had been in earth moving and now he was producing earth moving equipment. So he would encounter needs of all sorts. And also, um, he was one, even today in the factory, we still have the machines that he and his engineers designed to do a certain procedure that he needed. He needed to do something, and he was always getting bigger and bigger and bigger as our equipment you should see today. We're still doing that. Our largest running motor, the tires on it, are 13 feet tall. Uh, so we're still getting bigger. But RG would have a need, and rather than go buy a piece of equipment that would do that, he would just make it, you know, figure out what was needed and, and build it. So, um, <clears throat> but uh, that was just who he was, filling a need. He had just a drive for uh, a purpose in life, sharing Christ. Sharing Christ to him was just important, if not more important, than visiting his plants and building equipment. He loved to build big equipment. He, he'll tell you, he would tell you that. But he also loved to share Christ in any time, anywhere uh, that people would, would uh, ask him to come. Well, the factory here... That, happened, that started at the same time the school did in 1946. This was actually the very last factory that he built. Started out in Stock, Stockton, California. <clears throat> then he moved headquarters to Peoria, Illinois. Uh, then he went to Tocoa, Georgia. And that factory, that building's not there anymore. Then he went to Rydelmeyer, Australia. Uh, this was in 41, beginning of World War II. The Turner was supplying in the end of the, over the whole picture of World War II, Letourneau supplied 70% of the earth-moving equipment used by the U.S. and all of the Allies in World War II. Um, now, a lot of that was being pulled by a Caterpillar tractor, but all of the implements and all that, they estimate 70% of the equipment used in World War II, earth-moving equipment, was built by Letourneau and one of his plants. Reitelmeyer was, was a filling a need. If you build it closer to where it's going, then you don't have as far to ship it. So he built the plant there. Um, then he went to Vicksburg, Mississippi, which is, by the way, my hometown. Um, then he went to England, Stockton on the Tees, England. That factory lasted about a year. Um, there was a lot of complications, and they finally just ended it. And then in 46, later in 46, he came here. And, of course, we're still building equipment, and bigger and bigger and bigger, just as Mr. R.G. did. Um, <clears throat> another interesting thing about Mr. R.G. was, as he had these factories all over, and he didn't, he didn't close a factory and move to these different He had a factory in all of those cities. So transportation was a big thing. After 37, in the car accident, and once he recovered, he thought, Again, like he was thinking earlier in his childhood, there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> so in um, 38, he um, started looking for an aircraft, an airplane, to hop around those different air, uh, plants. And 30, 1939, he bought his first aircraft, the Waco, and uh, by, by plane, two wings with an enclosed cabin. And uh, that was his first one in 39. And that I've been researching that lately, and, and uh, I'm going to be talking about that at homecoming. We're going to the aviation anniversary, you know, we'll be talking about that. But by by 19 by the mid 60s, 
from 1939 to the mid-60s, associated with Mr. R.G., either the companies, one of the companies, or the Eternal Foundation, or one of his companies, by 19, the mid-60s, he had purchased 41 different aircraft. <coughs> the, and, and the last one that I'm gauging it to was a, a Learjet that he went to Kansas and took delivery from Mr. Bill Lear himself. And we have pictures of them discussing and everything. But R.G. was innovative, and he, you know, he, uh, he saw a need, and he filled it. Um, when he came to Longview, uh, this plant, this location really was not his, in his goal of coming here. He was actually going to Lone Star, where there's a steel mill, or was, I think it may still be open, but in 46, they were going good. He needed steel. Uh, the war had ended, and things were uh, ramping up. Production was ramping up. He needed more steel. So we actually flew out here, landed at the Gregg County Airport, and met Mr. Carl Estes, and they were going to fly north to Lone Star and look at the property, and, and he was going to consider building a factory there. As they left the airport, headed north, they took off and banked to the left. Miss Letourneau was with them that day. She looked out the window, and by the time they were in the position above us here, she looked down and saw Harmon General Hospital, which at the time this campus was covered with buildings, very obvious from the air. She looked down and said, what is that to Carl Estes? Now, Carl Estes was ex-military, had a lot of connections in Washington. She said, what is that? And Carl said, well, that's uh, Harmon General Hospital. They've decommissioned, and it's, there's no activity there. And she said, well, that would make a good school. Because she had already started one, two schools previous in other locations. She said, that would make a good school. R.G. turned to her and said, do you want it? <laughs> she thought a minute and said, yes. So he turns to Carl Estes, military connection, and Carl said, I'll take care of it. And here we sit today. <laughs> so they went on the Lone Star. Evidently, they weren't impressed. They came back here, bought this campus, and starting at the front of the plant over there, they bought 10,000 acres. It was all the way down to the swamps where Interstate Highway goes through and all around to where Eastman is. They bought 10,000 acres. Now, today, we don't have all of that. We have three or four thousand acres today. But, <clears throat> um, well, that brings us to today. Um, this is how the plant looked uh, when he, there's a high street there, which you can see high street was under construction. When he built the plant, I don't know if y'all wondered, I've wondered why all of the angles in there in here on marble that goes forward and then high street kind of cuts off the parking lot everything it wasn't there when this that factory was built high street was not there marble was the main road in so the front of the plant was parallel with marble that made sense and for whatever reason <laughs> they built high street cut off the corner of their property and it is how it is today but uh this has how the factory looked, and uh, this had to be in 1952 because the dome's not there. The dome is built in 53, would be sitting right there. So this was an early uh, look at how the factory looked uh, in the beginning. Now here today, as you can see, um, we have five domes. And this is how you can see the angle that the parking lot is all cut off, but this is where it originally was when the factory was built when this was put in. But this is dome one, which you can see by the road. The farthest dome is dome two, three, and then four and five. <coughs> um, the domes got started. RG had this concept. This dome one, we call it we call it the Billy Graham Tabernacle because it was actually built for Billy Graham. It was never intended to be there. It never intended to be there. Billy Graham and R.J. had been friends since the 30s. They had known each other through ministry. 
Um, Billy Graham had spoken at like the chapel, and he had spoken at chapel services in the plant. Mom had uh, camps, and Billy Graham would come to the camps. So they had known each other, but by 50, in the early 50s, 51, 52, Billy Graham's ministry had started growing. And during those days, he would have crusades, like in a football stadium, or he would set up huge tents, which are all portable, okay? Billy Graham came to RG one day and said, you know what, I, I would like to have something a little more substantial that I can move around and uh, to have my crusades in. And RG probably said, well, how many people were talking about here? 12,000. That dome right there, we'll see 12,000 people. And you can see that there's doors here, 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 all the way around. Safety factor, if something happens, boom, everybody can get out quickly, supposedly. Um, theoretically, you know. <clears throat> but, uh, so, RG, Billy Graham talked about it, and this is the idea that RG came up with. Now, this was 1953. This wasn't RG's first experience with the dome, though. Here's a dome structure that he built in Toccoa, Georgia. There in Toccoa, Georgia, he built a factory, and again, he bought like 12,000 acres. He had a dairy farm. He built a big lake. Um, and he built this was, they call it the Lake Louise Hotel and Conference Center. Dome structure, not near as big as these. But this was all steel. Even the buildings were made of steel paneled, uh, which he made houses during that time. But um, this is in Toccoa, Georgia. This right here is 1940. 13 years before this one here was built, and it, most people think, well, this is the first one. This was 1940 that he built this, used it for company activities, and they would probably lease it out to you know, uh, organizations that would want to have conferences and everything. You see the little chimney there, they had a kitchen, but in this hotel rooms in here, but it was built right on a lake. I think you see there's the, an aerial view. There's the lake, Lake Louise, that he named after his only daughter, Miss Louise. This picture is 1942. In 42, the military came in. World War II is going on. And they took over, in their fashion, about 600 acres of land and the hotel and turned the hotel into a hospital, military hospital. And the property they used for recreation or re, uh, recovery of you know, soldiers that would be brought in and they had activities, so they had plenty of room to do what they needed. But um, they built, the military built these buildings in between here. There, there in between those, the uh, wagon wheels. It looks like a big wagon wheel. So this was uh, not his first experience with domes. He had done that, and that is still standing today. Today, that all of that property is owned by the Georgia, the state, the Georgia State Southern Baptist Convention. So they still have conferences there. It's a Christian center available, you know, for different ones. And there's still motel rooms. I've actually stayed in one of the original rooms when I was over that way, and I asked to be put in one of those. They have some modern facilities, but I said, no, I want to be in one of the steel you know, rooms. <laughs> so during the night, I'm going, beating on the wall, you know. Um, I said, I'm really here, I'm really here. But, um, so, uh, then we, let's come to Longview. He started, built the factory in 46. This dome, the dome one, wasn't built in 50, until 53. <clears throat> um, dome one was uh, completed in 53, again for Billy Graham. He started designing, make, building it, and he thought, you know, I really better put it together one time and make sure this really works. Because <laughs> he had never done that of this type before. So they started building it, <coughs> and um, during the time they were constructing it, Billy Graham's organization were, they were uh, getting permissions to places that they wanted to go for this structure. They were first going to go to Michigan, and then they were going to go to England. And, and again, he wanted to have enough seating for at least 12,000 people. Michigan and England both 
turned them down. They said, no, you cannot bring that structure because it had not been uh, certified for public occupancy. It's 1953. You know, the cities and the, and the towns were being safe, and they said, no, you, this is a new design, new structure. You, there's no certification. We're not going to put 12,000 people in jeopardy for this. And so Billy Graham calls him said, sorry, can't use it. <laughs> and so it was never taken down. And that's why it is where it is. Had Billy Graham taken it, you know, he, or he probably would have built himself another one because he built four more after that. But the story of wine is there is because it was for Billy Graham and he couldn't use it, so they just never took it down. <clears throat> now, the construction of one of these, you would... They would pour a concrete footer to set the center pole on. The center pole had a winch at the ground level. Uh, let's see. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, here. This, this is dome one. still had a dirt floor. This has a winch here at the bottom of this pole. Cables would go up through pulleys and down the pulley system. The center piece, they would bolt together. It was steel. They bolted all together, then from this center piece, which was attached to the cables, it could be lifted. From the center here, they would attach the aluminum panels. Okay, there's your, this is down low when it started out. They've got the center piece and all the bolts you see there, and they're attaching the panels on the outside. One at a time. On the ground, these guys putting it together uh, may have used a six-foot ladder and 55-gallon drums, real technical equipment there. Um, but they bolted them all on, one panel at a time. And once they got them all on, then they would support their weight. So they would lift it, move the barrels, and then lift the whole thing. Now think about it. The, the dome that you see there, you could go today. And those, those winches are still there. You could go today, put new cables on it, new cables in there, engage that winch, there's a bolt, it's bolted down, take the bolt screw, pick it right up like an umbrella. And, uh, and, and that's how they dismantled it. Billy Graham wanted something that was portable. That is actually a portable building. <coughs> there's five domes. One and two are built of aluminum panels that are bolted together. Three, four, and five are steel panels that are welded together. Those are not portable. These two, lift it up, take the bottom ring off, lower it down, take the bottom ring off, lower it down until you get it down. Stack the panels on a truck and take the center pole down, put it on the truck, go set it up, put it all back together. Portable building. That's what Billy Graham was going to do. <clears throat> but um, now, number one was being built. They got a little past this point here. One weekend, everybody was off, no one was injured. But a storm came through, high winds. And you see that if you leave it like that, it's kind of like you've got a little umbrella there. High winds came along. Whoop, wrong way got under it, and it just started doing this until it collapsed. So Monday morning, they came to work, and this is what they found. And so they had to dismantle the whole thing. The panels that were bent beyond repair, and all the holes ripped out, they just scrapped them and made new panels. Um, the ones that could be straightened out, they did. And, and the, the panels, they bought uh, Alcoa aluminum, Reynolds aluminum, sheets of aluminum, large sheets, and in the factory, had a, he had his own machine shop, he made a die to stamp the shapes in here. Now they had, each one had a curvature, just enough to create the whole shape, but then each panel had these ribs pressed into them for rigidity. He had made a die to do that in the factory, and I believe there were only two, two sizes. The, the center three or four rings were one size, and then all of the rest of them, like nearly 1,100 panels, were all the same. 
<clears throat> but that weekend, storm came in, got under it, started rippling and came down, and they had to dismantle it all, start all over again. Uh, then they went right on through until they finished before they let another storm come in. But here, this is Dome 1. Dome 1 was being used at the time for a lot of different things. This still had a dirt floor before that we have concrete floor today. But for many years, it just had a dirt floor. This was a chapel service from the company. We all had chapel for years, had a chapel service. These panels were, were hung in here, and I read these. These were some sort of a fiberglass material panel, so they were lightweight, and they hung those for acoustics. But um, Letourneau, Letourneau Tech and then Letourneau College, they had graduation services in there. We got pictures of that. Um, Longview High School, during uh, rainy weather, had football practice in here. Uh -huh. I was giving a talk uh, several years to go and to a group, and a man came up, and I was talking about that. The man came up to me and said, I was there. I was in football practice. He said, I went in there many times. So plenty of rooms, dirt floor, so they had football practice in there. Uh, so a lot of usage, different usages, and eventually they poured concrete. And um, today, all of our domes are have used for weld-up or manufacturing of some parts or something. Except number one, the node two is our central shipping and receiving. So they're just racks of parts and, and that sort of thing in there. This is what it looked like in uh, 1953 after it completed in October or so, out in front of the plant there. <clears throat> That's it today. This is number two, started out construction, again, the aluminum panels. That's number two today. Number three, you see the difference in uh, the, the patterns that were pressed. And there's a little bit different configuration of the sphere. This was steel, all the joints were welded together. Uh, this one, and then four and five, which are down below the plan on 1945, you can see them. This is when they were being built, built at the same time, bring, being brought up, and then how they look today. <clears throat> um, let's see. Uh, well, um, I wanted to, to leave some time for some questions. Now, some, I have some information over here. Some of these are on the front here. To give a lot of more detail. Uh, like they're interested in like what size were each one of the panels, how much they weighed, there's details like that in here, some factory information. And last year, 70 years for the school and the company, and the company, we, uh, of course, we're Joy Global now, it's a little deal, uh, 70 years from 46 to 2016. But they put the dome on it in our 70 year anniversary. So there's this is figures you can have. Um, this is a little, or this kind of tells the story of what I talked about, Mr. Turno finding the campus and everything. And then a timeline of some of the equipment that we built through the years, just a little flyer. here. So as long as those last, those are available. Um, more information on the dome. Books that are available, there's been a lot of books written about RG and his equipment. These are some of them that are available. People may not know there's a book about Mom, Mom and Turno, right here. Uh, I think that's in the library. Any questions? Yeah, let's take some questions from Robert. <clears throat> What's going to happen to the dolls? Aha. Uh -huh. A lot of people asking that. Four years ago, <coughs> Eternal Technologies was bought out by Joy Global. They came in and they immediately said, we don't like any domes. They're circles, you can't get overhead cranes, and they didn't like them, and they said eventually they will all be gone. Um, so I immediately turned in a pro written proposal to them to save at least number one for historical values and that sort of thing. Time has gone, it's been four years, nothing has happened. Uh, now some of you may know that we were recently bought out by Komatsu. Now we're actually owned by Komatsu. Within a year or so, I may be working, well I do work for Komatsu, but the name could be changing, we don't know. So, what's going to happen? Nobody knows. I, I imagine at least the, the back four will be gone so they could build a, moder a long, modern manufacturing facility that can have an overhead crane 
because these are limited. In modern manufacturing, this, this space is limited, so we, but we really don't know. <coughs> these are some excellent models here. To give you a comparison of size, um, this one here is on the camps, but you can see the pond is like this one. Well, that's bigger. Yeah. This is just a, these were 3D printed, by the way, by some of the students here. But you can see the comparison. Here's the pond, and there's the dome. So just to give you some size comparisons of what could happen. Any more questions? When the dome's motion, you don't know how long approximately would it take for them to be set up and they'll be transported from location to location? Okay. Um, it took uh, 30 days. They were in one of the documents. They said uh, with the crew of men, about 30 days. And... Uh, Assuming that no storms came in and turned it upside down. What about that? And that was a crew of 10, right? Do what? That was a crew of 10. Oh, yeah, I think so. How many people do we have in this room? Okay. We can do the faster. We can do the faster. You mentioned the mom will turn out the building two other schools before the turnout. Say again? You mentioned that mom will turn out the building two other schools before the turnout. Tacoa, Georgia, she started a, a school. Um, Mom Letourneau had an affection for wayward boys or, uh, you know, single guys, and she would, they even lived in their home in Peoria, um, and she, she started schools there, small, and Tacoa, Georgia was more formal, it was a machinist school, which some of that transferred here, um, but yeah, she had some small ones started, and this was serious, when they got here and they got... 180 acres or whatever it is, she got serious then. We're here really be not because of RT, we're here because of mom. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, our people will be here for a while. If you have more questions, if you want to stay. Otherwise, let's thank him.